Hi, he said. Kathy could see him look her over, starting at her knees, slowly traveling up to her eyes where their eyes locked for a second. Reluctantly, he tore his eyes off Kathy. He turned to Rose and Lisa, nodding and greeting. The women nodded back in acknowledgement. He turned back to Kathy and said, You look well. Thank you, Kathy said in return. An awkward silence followed. Finally, Tom spoke, Kathy, I need to talk to you for a few minutes. Would that be all right? Kathy replied, I don't know, Tom. I have to be getting home. John will be waiting for me. I know, he said. This will only take a few minutes. Surely you can spare five minutes for an old friend? When he said old friend and not former lover or jilted husband, she knew he did not want to fight and decided to give him his five minutes. Tom turned to the girls and said, I want to talk to Kathy in private. I hope you don't mind. He started walking Kathy to her car, both Rose and Lisa followed right behind them. They both liked Tom, but at this stage, they did not know if he were capable of violence against her. After walking a few feet, he noticed that they were following along behind them. Tom turned to look at them, and a small smile crossed his face. Okay, I guess I will have to do this in front of you, he turned to Kathy and started speaking. Please let me finish what I have to say without interrupting me. I have to say it all, and if you say anything, I will not be able to finish, okay? Kathy nodded. Tom began, I know I am not a college-educated man. I don't speak well, it's my own fault. And I know that I have never been able to express my feelings openly. I suppose I did not tell you I loved you often enough, or how much you meant to me. I tried to rely on the songs and their meanings, the lyrics, to let you know how much I loved, even needed you. Obviously. I failed. Failed miserably. I loved you more than you will ever know. I was so happy with our lives together. I guess my happiness blinded me to your unhappiness. I am truly sorry I could not see it and did nothing to make it better. I want you to have this, he handed her the box. It will be my last gift to you. Its meaning is as much for you as it is for me. If you don't respond to the song, I will not bother you again. I will never come here to your work or your new home. If I see you on the street, it will be strictly by accident, I assure you. If your car breaks down, you can bring it in for repairs. With a little smile, he said, of course, this time I will charge you. Kathy, remembering their first meeting, smiled. Well, I guess that's all I wanted to say. He started to turn away, then turned back. There is one more thing. I want to thank you. We had three great years together, the three best years of my life, actually, and I will always remember them and think of you fondly. Finally, Tom turned and spoke to Rose and Lisa. Ladies, you showed me something today with your courage and loyalty. I am glad Kathy has friends such as you. I know you will look out for her. I am just surprised that you would think so badly of me. Did you really think I would do anything to? Tom's voice cracked, and he took a second to recover. He continued, her her. Since this will probably be the last time we ever see each other, this will really be our goodbye. I wish you both the best, that you find whatever it is that you are seeking in life, and that when you find it, you both get to keep it. Tom's voice cracked again on the word keep, but he was able to continue speaking without stopping. By this time, Rose was openly crying and gave Tom a big hug. When she did so, Tom whispered in her ear, if anyone tries to hurt or bother Kathy, will you let me know? When they broke the hug, Rose, crying and smiling at the same time, shook her head yes, indicating she would let him know. He then hugged Lisa goodbye and asked her the same question. She whispered, I will. Tom turned and walked away, never once looking back at the girls. He knew he couldn't, they would see the tears in his eyes. The girls watched Kathy's husband walk away. Rose turned to Kathy and said, if you let him walk away after that, John had better be worth it. Lisa just shook her head. The few times she met John, Lisa thought him a creep. Lisa tried hard, but she could not see what Kathy saw. She thought Kathy was making a mistake and, one time, told her so. Kathy got so upset, it almost ruined their friendship. Lisa did not say much about it after that. Once again, the three of them got into Kathy's car to listen to the CD. Once again, there was no card or note to go with the CD. 
Kathy took the CD in her hand and hesitated before putting it in the player. Kathy looked to Rose, then Lisa, and asked, Should I listen to it? Lisa said, Whatever you want. I'm not going to get in the middle of this. It was Rose who spoke up. After the way he exposed his innermost feelings, you have to listen to the song. You owe him at least that much. Kathy thought it over, and her curiosity got the better of her. She slipped it into the slot on the player. The sounds of the Beatles singing this boy softly came out of the speakers. Tom felt it summed up the situation perfectly. Someone stole his wife, Kathy, from him. John undoubtedly wanted her but did not love her like Tom loved Kathy. Even though Kathy hurt him badly, Tom would still take her back. He wanted her to know that even though Tom was wronged, he loved Kathy and would endure any amount of pain to get the woman he loved back. Tom was also sure that John would hurt Kathy in the long run. He had met his kind before. John was a user. He would use Kathy for sex, then dump her when he was through with her. Kathy listened to the haunting lyrics of the song and realized that Tom and the Beatles were prophets. That boy took my love away. He'll regret it someday. This boy isn't good for you, though he may want you too. This boy wants you back again. This boy wouldn't mind the pain. Would always feel the same if this boy gets you back again. She realized it in the end and did regret it. John was not good for her and made her cry in the car that day. Kathy did not understand or believe the words sung by the Beatles. Tom's reliance on the songs to convey his feelings once again did not achieve his goal. Kathy did not contact Tom as she placed the Beatles recording back into its place in the line. She was reminded that she had heard those words spoken to her by Tom before, a shame that she had forgotten. She reached into the case of boxes. Her fingers trembled as they settled on the first white box. Kathy closed her eyes as shame washed over her face. He had told her what he was doing with the very first box he gave her. She thought back to the day she received it. Kathy and Lisa were on their way to the mall on a Sunday morning. Tom was taking Kathy on a picnic that afternoon. Kathy wanted to buy some new clothes. Kathy was driving when Lisa asked her the question, So how is it going with your mechanic, Kit? Lisa immediately got annoyed and fired back. He is not just a mechanic, he owns his own business. You know that. Calm down, I was just joking with you. So, what's going on with you too? asked Lisa. He loves me. I know that much, Kathy answered. And you know this how? inquired Lisa. Kathy responded, I can tell by the way his smile lights up his face whenever he sees me. My car has never run so well. He has me bring it in all the time and has his guys work on it. I think there's nothing wrong with it. He wants to see me. He always has lunch waiting for me when I get there. God help someone if they hit on me while he's around. I've broken up two pissing matches already. He takes me places, treats me well, and is very protective. He loves me, all right? I just know it. He just hasn't sent it to me yet. Why not? What's holding him back? asked Lisa. Kathy stopped at a light and explained, Well, I think he might be waiting for me to make the first move. He's really a shy guy around women, replied Kathy. Lisa looked at Kathy and asked her, What about you? Do you love him? Truthfully, I'm not sure. I think I do, but I'm just not sure, replied Kathy. Not sure won't work with a guy like Tom. You have to be in love with the man before you can say you love him. So tell me the truth, do you love him? asked Lisa. It took a while before Kathy answered, It's been so long since I felt something like love for any man, not since John. Lisa had enough of John Williams and told Kathy, so I don't want to hear any more about J.N. He screwed you over, he left and never came back, not even a phone call or email. J.N. may have had lust for you, but not love. If he loved you, he would be here with you. You have a guy who you think loves you, and he's right here. He won't tell you he loves you, maybe he can sense you don't love him enough and he doesn't want to commit. If you want to keep him, you better make up your mind real quick or you'll lose him, Lisa exclaimed. If you let him go, you'll be sorry, you're losing Tom to John Williams, Lisa muttered under her breath. Kathy thought about what Lisa had told her. She thought she loved Tom but still could not get John out of her mind. Still, she did not want to lose Tom, she knew there was no one better out there for her and she could do a lot worse. Kathy took her time getting ready for today's date. It was a picnic in River Park, named for the river that ran through it. 
She wore a pair of cut-off shorts, jeans, and a red checkered shirt tied below her ribs, showing her midriff since it was Florida. Wearing a pair of flip-flops is always acceptable. They had a great day at the park. Tom brought some good food, two bottles of wine, and one blanket for both of them to sit on. After the day was done, the happy couple returned to Kathy's apartment. Tom told Kathy, Sorry, sweetie, but I have to leave early tonight. Why so soon, Kathy? Wind. We just got here. We can have more wine. Sit and talk. What do you say? I can't tonight, Tom complained unhappily. I have a meeting with a representative from Avis to provide roadside assistance to vehicles in this area. It could be a revenue stream for my business and maybe someday our business, babe. I have to be ready. I need my wits about me tomorrow. There are too many numbers to remember. I'm sorry, babe, but I have to go. Kathy was sad but resigned. I know you have to go, honey. Call me tomorrow when the meeting is over, she asked. He walked to her and gave her a kiss. You can count on it, he replied huskily. After he left, Kathy changed into something more comfortable, a t-shirt and sweatpants. As Kathy lounged watching TV, she was taken by surprise to hear the doorbell ring. Peering out through the peephole, she saw Tom standing there and threw open the door, letting him in. She was pleasantly surprised. Did you forget something? She asked breathlessly. Yes, and it's you, he replied, once again gathering her in his arms and kissing her. He took a step back, and for the first time, Kathy saw a thin white box Tom held it in front of her so Kathy could see it. Tomorrow, I will be meeting with a powerful representative of a potential business partner. I will be able to speak to him as an equal, tell him what I think, and listen to his responses with no trouble. With you, however, I have more of a problem. Kathy, for some reason, I can't express myself as verbally as I want to, Tom stammered. He then handed her the box and said, I hope this tells you how I feel about you. Call me anytime, he gulped. Kathy took the box as Tom walked out of the apartment. Kathy was confused by his actions. She went to the window and watched him drive away before opening the box. Inside, there was a CD and a note. Kathy remembered that night as if it were yesterday. She placed the CD in the player and read the note again, just as she had done that night. A Randy Travis song played on the player. When you meet the certain someone you've been searching hard to find. In the time we spend together, I have learned to trust in you. It completes a perfect union between a woman and a man. So please don't misunderstand me. I don't want to go too far. Without knowing just one answer, can I trust you with my heart? The only thing written on the note was the line, can I trust you with my heart? That night, Kathy thought for a minute and then called Tom on her cell. When he answered, hello, all she said was, yes. Tom asked her, what? Kathy answered, you can trust me with your heart. I'll be right back, Tom shouted through the phone. Kathy was waiting in the hall as Tom ran up the stairs. He picked her up in his arms and carried her into the apartment, kicking the door shut with his foot. His voice trembled as he told her, I love you, Kathy. I love you like I have never loved another person on this earth. I feel the same about you, Tom, Kathy whispered as they made love for the first time that night. In his excitement, Tom never noticed that Kathy did not actually say the words, I love you too. Kathy cried when she thought of that night. She now realized, too late, that she did love him too. Maybe she loved him the first time she saw him in the repair shop. Now it was all too late. Kathy put the white box away and pulled out the black box. She thought about the events that led up to her receiving the black box. It had been three weeks since she had spoken with Tom in front of her work. True to his word, Kathy had not seen or heard from him since. On a Friday morning, John was about to leave for work when he asked Kathy, Do you want to go out to eat after work this evening? How about Kelly's downtown? He suggested, Kathy knew that was a place that she and Tom went often. No, Kathy snapped. You know Tom and I went there often. I won't go any place where I might run into him. If not there, I heard about a new bar and grill that opened up a few blocks from where you work. I can drive you to work and then pick you up at five. I'll wait for you outside the office. What do you think? Jan asked. Kathy thought about that and joked, that sounds like a plan. John was waiting for her and drove her to the new place called the Easton Avenue Pub, obviously named after the street it was located on. 
Kathy was puzzled when she saw the look of disdain on the faces of the waitress and bartender when they walked in. They sat in a booth on the rear wall in the back. The waitress came and gave them menus and water, and soon she was back to take their drink order. As the waitress was taking their order, Kathy heard the door to the pub open. She took a look to see who it was and was shocked to see her former husband walk in and take a seat at the bar. She heard him order his customary gin and tonic. She glared at John and asked him, Did you know he would be here? Jan gave her a smirk, replying, No, of course not, Kay. Kathy knew right away he was lying, but she had no idea what to do. Before she could say anything else, John announced to her, I have to go to the restroom, got up from his chair, and started to walk to the bar. He asked the bartender where the restroom was, and the bartender pointed to the large sign that clearly said restrooms. John then said, Hey, buddy, I did not see you sitting there. Kathy knew that was a lie also. She had pointed Tom out to him. Tom just looked at him and turned back to his drink and took a sip. John walked to where Tom was sitting and put his hand on the back of Tom's chair and smirked, Don't feel so bad. She picked the best man and it wasn't you. Tom looked at him as John looked at Kathy with a large smile on his face. Tom looked over his shoulder and saw Kathy sitting there watching. Tom turned back to John and said, Yeah, she picked you. John laughed, patted Tom on the back, and said, That's right, she picked me, not you, and walked off to the restroom. Kathy was horrified at what she had just witnessed. She knew Tom did not deserve that. She could not tear her eyes away from her former husband. He put the drink to his lips and finished it in one gulp. He went to pay, and the bartender said it was on the house. Tom got off his chair and walked directly to Kathy. That was low, Kathy. Even for you. Did you get a kick out of seeing me humiliated? I told you I would never bother you again, and I haven't. Now I get this? You two were made for each other, he told Kathy with a look of disgust. Kathy told Tom, I knew nothing about this. You have to believe me. I did not know you would be here or that he would do this. After what you did to me, why would I believe you now? I don't trust you. I don't like him, Tom snapped. John walked up to the table and sneered, Are you still here? Tom turned to John and just stared at him. She could see her soon-to-be ex-husband's hand curl up into a fist. Kathy's mind wandered back to a time when they were a happily married couple. Kathy and Tom were play-fighting one night, and she hit him with her fist. He stopped her and told her not to tuck her thumb inside her fingers. He explained that her thumb could break if she hit anyone hard. She watched as his thumb curled under his fist between the first and second knuckles of his left hand, just the way he taught her to. They stood there toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and Kathy thought she saw fear in John's eyes. The waitress walked over with Kathy's Cosmo and John's beer and said, This isn't the place for this. Tom, without taking his eyes off John, said, Amanda, you are probably right. Tom backed away from John, not turning until he got a safe distance, then turned and walked out of the pub. She did not know it then, but he walked out of her life that night as well. John followed Tom to the entrance and watched him leave. Amanda put the drinks on the table and said to her with disdain dripping from her voice, So, you dumped Tom for that? Do you know this is the third time he has done that to Tom? She walked away shaking her head. When John came back to the table, he was noticeably upset. What did he talk to you about, he demanded. Kathy was furious, but before she could say anything to John, a man walked up to the table. I don't know if you remember me, but I was at your wedding to Tom, Kathy replied. I'm sorry, but I do not remember you. I am Tom's friend, Paul. I was there with my wife, Phyllis. I gave Tom something during the meal. Kathy remembered. He, along with two other friends of Tom's, came up to the desk we were eating the fruit salad and put their cherries in Tom's cup saying, at least now he would have a cherry tonight. Everyone had a good laugh at Tom's expense. Kathy laughed, I remember the cherries. How are you, Paul? Then he turned to John and said, I am the owner of this establishment. Tonight's meal is on the house. When you are finished with your meal, I want you to leave immediately. Neither one of you are welcome back. Kathy's face turned a deep crimson with embarrassment. John just laughed. Paul continued, I have a word of warning for you, looking directly at John. Tom would not do anything to cause trouble in my place. 
However, if you should see you again any place else you should run the other way. He will not be so charitable again. John sneered and commented, I am not afraid of him. Don't say you weren't warned. Paul replied and started to walk away then turned, smiled, and said, I just hope I am there to see it. Kathy ate her food in silence. She was furious with John. She knew this was a setup to humiliate Tom. The food was delicious. She was sad she could not come back here again. She remembered talking to Paul and his wife. She liked them immediately. She would have liked to reconnect with him after John's stunt. She knew that could not happen. To make matters worse, he did not leave a tip that night. Kathy and John had their first serious fight. John was just being John. He was mad. He could not understand why she would side with that wimp. John was just making sure her ex-husband knew who Kathy belonged to. He was staking his claim. He was telling Tom to stay away. Even though he was having doubts, he could keep him away. At this point, Kathy was convinced John could not. Not if Tom wanted to. With a mixture of sadness and relief, she no longer thought he was interested. The sadness was the knowledge that part of her life was definitely over, relief that there would be no violence. As she remembered, tears fell from her eyes, the pain he felt, she was feeling now. Her memories were becoming very painful for her. Somehow, she felt she had to continue going through the boxes until she hit the last red box. One week later, Kathy was at work when she heard the door to the agency open. Kathy looked up to see who it was, and to her shock, it was Tom's cousin Janice, the one she had told that she loved Tom and would never hurt him. Janice looked very professional in a gray pinstripe business suit skirt with a jacket and a white shirt. She strolled up to Kathy with a pissed off look on her face, carrying an attache case in her left hand. You don't keep your promises very well, do you, Kathy? She hissed. I am sorry, Janice. I didn't mean for this to happen, it just did, Kathy explained. Janice looked at the nameplate on her desk and picked it up. Is this you? Are you still Kathy Holden? Kathy replied, yes, I am. Good, said Janice. She put her attache case on her desk and pulled out a white folder and threw it on her desk. You have been served, Janice said with obvious disdain. Then she pulled out the black box and as she threw it on top of the folder, she said in a loud voice, you stupid, cheating 304. You hurt him bad. He's way too good for you, you know that, don't you? His heart is broken. Don't you worry, he'll find someone else to mend his heart. I know one day you will be dragging your sorry ass back to him. He would probably take you back too. That's why I hope you will already have found someone else to take your place. Oh, by the way, you should listen to the CD. I did. It's beautiful. My cousin was always too good for you. Janice yelled. Janice turned to walk away when Kathy heard someone yell, Wait. She saw Grace get up and walk to Janice. Grace stood with her back to Kathy, facing Janice. They spoke for a few seconds, and Janice shook her head yes. She saw Grace hand something to Janice. Janice looked at Kathy as a smile came over her face. She turned back to Grace, smiled again, and shook her head yes again. Janice turned to walk out the door, and Kathy could hear her laughing. Grace walked back to her desk, and Kathy thought she could see a smile on her face also. Kathy opened the box and took out the CD. There was no card this time, and this time only Rose and Lisa came to listen to the CD. Lisa asked, Do you want to play it now or wait until after work in the car? Kathy said, Janice said it was beautiful, why not play it now? She put the CD into the player on her desk, and a Garth Brooks song played. It was the dance, and it was beautiful. Looking back on the memory of the dance we shared, Neat the Stars Above. For a moment all the world was right. How could I have known that you'd ever say goodbye? And now, I'm glad I didn't know the way it all would end, the way it all would go. Our lives are better left to chance. I could have missed the pain, but I'd have had to miss the dance. Rose and Lisa were openly crying now, even though Kathy wasn't. There were many pairs of misty eyes in the office. Most of the women liked Tom. Here he was saying all the pain was worth it just to have had the time with her. Kathy did not understand it then. Kathy understood exactly what he was saying with the song this time. It hurt to go through it, 
but the pain was worth what he had. Why couldn't she see it when it all happened? Kathy put the CD back into its box and placed it into the case. She would only see Tom one more time. It was after the divorce was final. She took the papers to her lawyer. It was a 50 to 50 split on everything except his business. Tom would not give her any of his business. She did not care, she was going to be a doctor's wife. Let him keep his business. She signed the papers. John and Kathy were married one month after the six-month waiting period was over. John's practice was doing well. J.N. had hired two nurses, a receptionist, and a biller. Kathy and John had sold the apartment and purchased a nice home in the same neighborhood as Tom's Kensington Street home, just a few blocks away. As John's practice grew, he started to work some late nights. Kathy was not happy, but she realized his patience came first after all. As John told her, I took the hypocritic oath, I have patience to treat, plus he chuckled, they paid the bills. One Friday night, John's receptionist called to tell Kathy that the doctor was running late and had more patients to see before he could leave for the night. Kathy was disappointed, she had made chicken cacciatore with spaghetti for John's dinner that night. She decided to be the good wife like the TV show and pack his dinner and bring it to the office so he could have something good to eat. She drove to the office and was surprised to see only two cars in the parking lot, one was John's, and she did not recognize the other one. She got out of her car, took the cacciatore, and went to the door of the office and tried to open it. To her surprise, the door was locked. No problem, after all, she had her own key. She dribbled the food in one hand as she dug into her purse to feel for her keys. Finally, she found them and let herself in. And as she was about to call out, she heard noises from one of the examination rooms that made her heart drop. What she heard was not doctor-patient conversation, it was the sounds of two people making love. She turned the knob on the door and pushed it open. Kathy could not believe the scene in the room. An older, obviously bleached blonde woman was lying on the examination table. John was naked and standing at the end of the table, his hips moving back and forth, obviously having sex with that woman. Neither of them had heard her come in. Kathy screamed, What is going on here? With that, she threw the cacciatore at the copulating couple. The food flew all over both of them, the chicken fell between the woman's naked body and the spaghetti and sauce was on both of them. Kathy slammed the door shut and ran from the office, started her car, and started laughing at the spectacle of John and his new bimbo covered in sauce. Then another thought crept into her consciousness, chicken cacciatore and spaghetti was the first meal she had served to Tom. Kathy started her car and sped away. She didn't know what to do, she did not want to go right home. She called her friend Lisa's cell phone. Lisa was out with the rest of the girls that worked at the insurance agency for a girl's night out. Kathy told her she had a fight with John and needed someone to talk to. Lisa told her that Rose was the only one left, and they were at the e Avenue pub. Kathy told Lisa that she was banned from that particular establishment. Kathy suggested they meet and talk outside the pub. The women said, We will meet you outside. Kathy said, I'll be there in 20 minutes. Lisa warned, there's one more thing you need to know. Tom is here with a girl. Kathy stammered, I don't care. I need to talk to you girls tonight, okay? Kathy, we will be waiting, Lisa responded. Kathy thought about Tom, what she saw was the same thing he had seen in his own home that awful night. She now knew firsthand the pain and humiliation he must have felt. She was going to her best friends for comfort and support. She realized that when she betrayed Tom, he had his best friend who did he have to go to for comfort and support. She knew the answer, nobody, he had to bear the pain on his own. Kathy opened the door to her car to let Lisa and Rose in. Kathy was still sobbing softly when they entered the car. Immediately Lisa wanted to know what happened. Kathy could hardly speak. When she calmed down, she recounted what she saw. I saw some 40-year-old bleached blonde with huge fake tits on an examination table being serviced by my new husband, Kathy roared. Neither Lisa nor Rose was surprised at Kathy's revelation, both girls considered John a jerk. They were more surprised than had taken Kathy so long to see it for herself. They tried to support her but were not willing to give her a pass. Rose told her, what goes around comes around. I know, I know, Kathy cried. 
I did the same thing. Don't think I haven't thought of that already. I feel betrayed and humiliated by what John has done, what he has done to me. I never felt that way about what I did to Tom. Now I know the truth. Now I know the pain, the humiliation, the betrayal, the loss of something you thought was special, to know the one you love thought so little of it. I know now, now I know. Lisa and Rose glanced at each other, and by mutual unspoken consent, they did not beat up on Kathy anymore, she was doing a good job on her own. Rose asked Kathy, what are you going to do now? Kathy responded decisively, I don't know. I am so confused. Then, after a few moments, she made a quick decision. I am going home to confront John. What he did is unacceptable and will have to stop, she spat decisively. Lisa asked, do you want us to go with you? Kathy replied, no, I have to do this by myself. The girls got out of the car and watched Kathy drive off. They walked back into the pub, and as they walked to the bar, Tom was there ordering drinks and saw them. A huge smile came across his face. Rose, Lisa, so good to see you. How long has it been? Almost a year, he gave them each a hug. Neither Rose nor Lisa smiled and only gave him a slight hug in return. Tom, recognizing that their response was less than friendly, moved back. I'm sorry, he apologized. I didn't realize it was like that. I'll be going. Tom stepped away puzzled. He thought the last time they were together he left on a positive note. Then again, he thought, they are Kathy's friends, so why be friendly to me? Lisa realized the sudden change in his attitude first and called Tom back. Wait, it is not what you think. Please, come back. We need to talk to you. Lisa and Rose wanted to take Tom to the booth and talk to him. First, he said he would have to clear that with his dinner companion. He walked to his date and spoke with her. She looked over at Lisa and Rose and spoke briefly with him again. Finally, she smiled at him and shook her head yes. Tom walked back to Lisa and Rose's table and sat down. What is this all about? Why are you guys giving me the cold shoulder? He asked, confused. He waited for their answer. Rose responded, it has nothing to do with you. We just received bad news tonight. My God, I never thought of that. Is there anything I can do to help? Tom inquired. Lisa responded, there probably is, but I don't think you would want to. What? What are you talking about? Tom asked. Tom had been leaning forward, his arms on the table, fully involved. Lisa said, it has to do with Kathy. Tom pushed back from the table to the back of the seat as if he had just heard the rattle of a rattlesnake. His manner changed instantly. What does she have to do with this? Tom asked warily. She just caught John cheating tonight, Lisa blurted. His face said it all, first it went totally blank, then a small smile grew into a huge smile, and finally an outright belly laugh. When he finished laughing, he leaned forward with his head down, shaking it back and forth, and said, Karma, karma is A. Then he looked at the women and asked, still chuckling, Why are you telling me this? What does it have to do with me? Nothing, Rose said. We just wanted you to know why we were down tonight. Tom's attitude changed once again. Sorry, girls. I jumped to a wrong conclusion. I should have known better. So, where is she now? He asked. Lisa replied. She went home to confront him. That is definitely not a good idea. John's a coward, but he won't hesitate to hurt a defenseless woman if he becomes angry, Tom stated. Anger flashed in Rose's eyes. If he's the coward, why didn't you fight for her when you had the chance? She asked smugly. Tom once again sat back in his seat, but without the revolt this time. Finally, he leaned back into the girls with a profound sadness on his face. I asked her if she loved him. She told me she did. She told me she did not love me anymore. What was there left to fight for? If I beat him up, would that make her love me once more? No, she would have hated me. So, where was the sense? I was in a lose-lose situation. She still would not love me, and I could go to jail. Do you understand my reasoning now, Rose? Tom asked. Rose nodded her head. Yes, now ashamed I even asked the question, Lisa asked. 
So what are you going to do? Tom was unmoved. I'm not doing a damn thing. She is no longer my problem, he remarked. You can't mean that. You loved her once, reminded Lisa. That was a long time ago. Things and people change, Tom countered. Rose spoke up. Now I know you, Tom. I have known you for five years now. I have spoken to Paul about you. Surprised? Don't be. You are highly thought of here. I have overheard stories told about you by your friends here in this bar. You have lots of friends, don't you? Even when you had a falling out with one of them, if they needed something, you still helped out. Kathy was your best friend, even though she hurt you badly. You would still not desert her. Maybe it was the way you were brought up or maybe your military background, but you don't let people down. You don't change, Tom Holden. Not you, Rose responded. Rose held Tom's eyes while she spoke. Now he held her eyes as he spoke. Rose, this is a family matter. This is something that should be settled in the courts. Frankly, this is a problem that I have no way of helping. Somehow, I feel that this is her just reward, chickens coming home to roost, if you get my drift. If she ever really needs me in a way I can be of help, you can count on me to do my part. What I said to both of you that day in the parking lot still stands. If anyone hurts her or tries to hurt her, I expect for you to let me know. This does not fall into that category. He hurt her, but no less than she hurt me. Bottom line, ladies, I will not get involved in her family dispute. Maybe they will be able to get past this. Maybe she will fight for this marriage, unlike what she did to me. Maybe he will realize his mistake and not do it again. Maybe she will forgive him. I don't know, but it is not my place to butt in here, not now, Tom insisted. An uncomfortable silence ensued. Tom broke the silence first, remarking, Ladies, it would have been nice to see you under different circumstances. I hope if I do see you again, we can have a few drinks and some laughs. Now, if you will excuse me, I have a date to get back to. Tom left the booth. As he started to walk away, he turned back and confirmed, Remember, if anything bad should happen, please let me know. Both girls nodded in return. They watched him return to the table and sit down. His date said something, and he started talking. There came a point in the conversation that he started smiling and chuckling. When the girl put her fork down and was obviously berating him, Lisa and Rose knew he had told her about the cheating and started laughing at Kathy's predicament. That is when his date got mad at him. Tom put his head down and started nodding, first yes, then no, and finally, he didn't know what to do, so he just sat there staring at his plate. When she finished, she placed her hand on his and smiled. You could just read her lips when she said, I understand. Tom seemed to have lost his appetite and pushed his food away. His date had time to eat while he talked to Lisa and Rose. He got the check, and they left. Lisa and Rose were left wondering how Kathy fared when she went home that night to confront John. They paid their bill and left the bar. Neither woman left with a good feeling. Kathy called in sick Monday and Tuesday. Lisa was concerned but did not want to interfere. Like Tom, she felt it was a family matter. Besides, she had been burned once before for getting involved in Kathy's affair with John, it would not happen again. On Tuesday, she called John's office, and it was open for business, the doctor was in. They obviously weren't home, working on their problem. Lisa decided to call Kathy on her cell. Lisa left a message, worried about Kathy and asked her to please return her call. Kathy did not return her call. Lisa and Rose decided to go to Kathy's home if she did not return to work on Wednesday. It was 9.05, and Lisa and Rose were deciding what to do when they saw Kathy's car pull into the parking lot. Feeling greatly relieved, they went to their desks and started working. When Kathy walked through the door, the women were horrified. The large sunglasses did nothing to hide the bruises around Kathy's left eye. The heavy makeup on her right cheek suggested more facial damage. Lisa and Rose quickly ushered Kathy into the ladies' room and locked the door. Lisa ripped the glasses off her face and gasped. Kathy's left eye was black and blue. There was still minor swelling around the bottom of her eye. Lisa looked closely at her cheek and could see the palm and five fingers where John's open hand had slapped her right cheek. 
Kathy was stoic, apparently, she was all cried out. Rose asked, what happened? Kathy started crying. She was not all cried out, Kathy finally stopped and told the women what happened. John was home when she got there, he immediately yelled at her, where have you been? Who have you been talking to? What did you think you were doing, throwing that disgusting food at us? Kathy cut in, so important, you had to screw her on your examination table. John was livid, he reared back and punched Kathy in the eye. Kathy screamed and fell to the floor, she had never felt such pain. Kathy was almost knocked out. John grabbed his wife by the hair, held her head up, and slapped Kathy across the face with his left hand. Kathy saw stars and then nothing. When Kathy woke up, John was going nuts in the house, breaking knickknacks and kicking furniture against the walls. When John noticed Kathy stirring, he knelt over her again and pulled Kathy up by her blouse. He thundered, this is the way it will be from now on. If I want to work late, you'll just have to put up with it. If you don't like it, you can leave, if you dare. If you give me any more problems, you'll get more of what you got tonight, he screamed at her. Do you understand? Kathy was terrified, she cowered away from him and nodded her head yes. Good, he ranted, now go upstairs and get yourself fixed up. Kathy went to the bathroom and splashed cold water on her face, taking a good look in the mirror, her eye and right cheek were already swelling. Going into the kitchen, Kathy took some frozen peas out of the freezer, retreating upstairs to lie down. She placed them on her swollen face. The next morning, Kathy woke up still in the same clothes she had worn the day before, the peas had thawed out and were under her head. Kathy went to her bathroom and was surprised to see her whole face was swollen. She spent the whole day with something cold on her face to bring down the swelling. John was nowhere to be found. Kathy was relieved, she did not want to see him anyway. John did not come home until Sunday afternoon, he offered no explanation of his whereabouts, and she did not ask. That night, John wanted sex, Kathy said no, she was too hurt for sex. He just left again, he came home Monday to take a shower and get changed, then left for the office. The girls listened silently, first in complete shock at her tale, then getting angry at John's callousness. Lisa urged Kathy to go to the police and have him arrested for assault and battery. No, Kathy cried. I want to make this marriage work. I want to work things out. I already screwed up one marriage. The women exploded. He beat you up. He did something despicable to you. Do you think this will be the last time? Yelled Rose. I know, replied Kathy. I just can't give up so quickly, Lisa fumed. I don't know what to do. She gave up and walked away. Rose followed suit but not before she quickly took a photo with her cell phone. She knew exactly what she was going to do. Rose left work half an hour early. She drove directly to Tom's shop, parked her car in front of one of the open bays, and walked towards the bay door. Tom was working on a 1964 Jaguar XAY. When he looked up and saw Rose pull into the lot in front of bay number two, he picked up a rag to clean his hands and smiled as Rose got out of her car. At first, Rose didn't see him in the shadows of the shop at this hour of the day. As he emerged from the shadows, she took in the handsome man walking towards her. She was always impressed with his muscular body. As Tom walked confidently towards her with a big smile on his face, Rose thought Kathy was out of her mind to give that up. Even the act of cleaning his hands with that white rag seemed sexy. Good to see you, Rose. Having car trouble? He asked. No, nothing like that. I need to speak with you in private, if that would be okay, she said. He looked at her puzzled for a second and said, Sure, come into the office. Rose followed him to the office where he sat behind a small, cluttered desk and indicated that she should sit in the chair opposite him. They sat in silence for a while, waiting for her to begin the conversation. Rose wasn't sure how to start, and she finally blurted out, Kathy is having problems with John. The neutral look on his face changed to anger, then disdain. Any problems in her relationship with that a-hole are no longer my problems. Good riddance to that three. He couldn't complete the sentence, even if he felt she was a 304, he couldn't talk about Kathy like that. Wearily, Tom began, Rose, I just don't care if they have problems. What does it have to do with me? Do you remember the day you met us outside work? She asked. 
when you gave her the box with the Beatles song inside it? Yeah, I remember. It didn't work, did it? Nothing seemed to work, not even a phone call from that witch. She ripped my heart out. So now what, I'm supposed to care what happens to her? She didn't care about me, did she? Tom ran. Rose was taken aback by his outburst. Maybe she was wrong. He might think this was what she deserved, getting beaten up by her lover. Had the love he had for her turned to hate? Would he even care anymore? She plunged ahead. It's more than that. She pulled out her phone and scrolled to the picture she took this morning. She handed the phone to him. She tried to read his face, but there was no emotion, no inkling of what was going on behind the mask on his face. Did you take this? He inquired. This morning, replied Rose. He looked at it for a few more seconds and handed it back to Rose. That's too bad. What do you want from me? He asked. Rose was shocked by his lack of concern. Aren't you going to do something? What about what you said to Lisa and me? You said, tell you if somebody tries to hurt her. She has been hurt. Was that just so much? She yelled. Call the cops, Rose. It looks like assault and battery to me. Rose was incensed. That's it? That's all you have to say? Tom responded. What do you want me to say? Do you expect me to protect her virtue? She has no virtue. She had her affair. She broke her vows. She didn't care about me. She didn't care about my pain. Give me a good reason why I should care about her pain. Just give me one reason, Rose. Just one good reason, begged Tom. She looked into his eyes. She could see the pain in them. Because you love her. I can see it on your face. Isn't that a good reason, Rose, stated. Sorry, Rose, you're wrong. I loved her once. Back then, but not now. The feeling I have for her is definitely not love. Not anymore. Tell her to call the cops. I'm not getting involved, Tom stated flatly. Rose looked long and hard at him. Finally, shaking her head, she stood to leave. As she walked out the office door, Rose turned and spoke to him, You surprised me today. I thought better of you. I never thought you would let some man beat your wife. Abruptly, he stood. For the first time today, she could see anger flash in his eyes. And that's the crux of the matter, she is not my wife. If she were, I would have to be dead before I would allow some a-hole to lay a finger on her. She chose that a-hole over me. I was her husband, yet she picked him over me. I guess she wanted to trade up, be a doctor's wife, not the wife of a mechanic. She made her bed, let her lie in it, agonized Tom roared. Rose replied, I'm sorry, Tom. I did not realize how you felt. Not that I blame you, she must have hurt you deeply, Rose commiserated. Tell her to call the authorities, Rose. Tell her to get a divorce, she already knows how to do that. Sorry if I disappointed you today, Rose, but I just can't, he replied. Rose walked through the doorway and out of the shop. Tom followed after her, he stood in the middle of the bay, watching her. As Rose opened her car door, she apologized to him, saying sadly, I'm sorry to have bothered you today. I hope I didn't ruin your evening. He did not reply before she started her car. Rose looked through the windshield into his face. The expression was hard to read. Pain, anger, disdain, hatred. Rose couldn't tell which. Maybe it was a mixture of all those emotions. Whatever his emotions were, he decided not to help. Rose started her car and drove away. Kathy, you really screwed it up, she thought as she drove away. She had failed the day when she was so sure Tom would help. As Rose drove away, she had no idea how to help her anymore. Kathy came to work on Thursday and Friday. There were no bruises that could be seen, but she was definitely becoming more and more rattled. The girls did not know about any physical violence, but they were sure she was being sexually abused. Monday morning brought a change in Kathy. Everybody could see it since when she walked in the door to work, she said hi to everyone and even smiled, something Kathy had not done in a while. Lisa and Rose dragged Kathy to their sanctuary, the ladies' restroom, and locked the door. What's going on, Kathy? What happened? Lisa asked. 
Jayan got beat up Friday night outside his office. He got beat up really bad. Whoever did it made him promise to apologize to me. John said that the ascent told him that if he did not apologize to me, he would know and come back and finish the job, whatever that meant. John doesn't know it, but I know who it was, saying Kathy. How do you know? Rose said. I heard him talking to himself in the shower this weekend, and he was cursing out my ex-husband, Tom giggled. Kathy, how could he find out about this? Kathy asked. Rose said it was me. I told him about it Wednesday after work. Kathy hugged Rose and thanked her. Kathy told her friends that she had made up her mind and was leaving John. She would see a lawyer tomorrow about getting a divorce. Kathy thanked Rose again for helping. Rose said, Don't thank me. I didn't kick thee out of your husband. Kathy mused, Maybe you're right. I should go and thank him myself. I don't know about that, Kathy. He's not too fond of you right now. You didn't hear the way he was talking about you when I went to see him, warned Rose. I know, Rose. After what I did, he probably hates me, but I still need to thank him in person. That's the least I can do, asserted Kathy. Both women agreed. Lisa walked in the Easton Avenue pub first, followed by Rose, with Kathy bringing up the rear. They sat at a table only a few feet away from him. Tom was sitting at the bar, immersed in thought while drinking his second gin and tonic. He never noticed them come in. Lisa gestured for Kathy to get on with it. A nervous Kathy trembled slightly and walked to her former husband. She sat on the empty seat next to him and saw the bandaged and swollen right hand. She could see that his left hand had scratches on it but was not hurt badly enough to not pick up his drink with it. He still had not realized that someone was sitting on his right. His mind must have been somewhere else that night. Kathy reached out and placed her hand tenderly over his bandaged hand and said, It must be very painful. His head never moved but his eyes moved to his right, and he could see her. It is not too bad, it will be better in a few weeks. What do you want, Kathy? He asked in a not too friendly tone of voice. Please, implored Kathy. I just want to talk, not fight. Is that okay? He nodded his head. Kathy noticed that he had not removed her hand from his bandage. One he did not because he actually still craved her touch, no matter how it hurt him, Kathy began. I want to thank you for what you did on Friday. I know it was you. After all I did, you still helped me when I needed someone. I felt I had to come to thank you in person. I owe you that. She looked at his handsome profile, unblemished from the beating he gave to J.N. Kathy put her hand on his chin and turned it to her, saying, Can't you even look at me? His face was clear and unmarked. He wasn't able to hurt you at all, was he, Kathy? She asked. He thought you were a coward, but you knew that, didn't you? I was worried about you. I guess I shouldn't have been. I guess he was wrong about me, Tom said with a sad smile. Tom wrenched his head out of her grasp and turned back, lifting his drink to his lips and taking a swallow of the clear liquid. I am leaving him, Tom, Kathy confided. I will be moving in with Lisa until I get a place of my own. I will be getting a divorce from J.N. I want to start seeing you again, if you will let me. I realized that what I did was stupid. I finally found out who my real love is, and it is you. I want desperately to recover what we had. I want you back, if you will have me. He finally turned to face Kathy, pulling his bandaged hand out from under hers as he moved. You wanted to thank me, he replied angrily. It really wasn't necessary. I would have done the same thing if I saw a man beating a stray dog on the street. You were worried? Not likely. Were you worried that morning when you left me alone in the house to go with the a-hole? Did you care about my pain, what I was going through? No, you only care about yourself. Why do you care now? You got what you wanted. But I get it. Why be stuck with an ordinary auto mechanic when you could be a doctor's wife, isn't that it? So, you used me, didn't you? All of you. You got what you wanted from me. What did I get? I get more pain. My hands hurt like hell. My girlfriend is mad enough to dump me for helping you. I might still go to jail for my actions. Tomorrow you will have another long-lost lover in your bed keeping you company. The only company I will have is my pain. Why don't you go, all three of you? Leave me alone. 
Kathy had been shaking her head no during his verbal onslaught. Looking directly into her eyes, he said, just go. Kathy's face paled under his onslaught. She had not realized how much pain he was in. The pain was easy to see in his eyes. It was written all over his face. Before the abuse she received from J.N., she never thought too much about what he went through. Now she finally understood. John had done the same thing to her as she had done to Tom. Now she understood the pain, the betrayal, and the humiliation. Yes, now she knew. But what to do now? Kathy started to speak, but he silenced her with a wave from his bandaged hand. If you won't leave, then I will, he spat. He quickly slipped off the bar stool and was off in a flash, giving Rose and Lisa a disapproving look as he walked by and out the door. Kathy was visibly shaken. She looked at the women with a bewildered expression on her face. Go after him, Kathy, Lisa implored. The women ran out the door, only to see Tom drive off in his pickup truck. They went to Lisa's place to discuss what happened that night. None of them were happy with the way things had played out. Kathy took out the last of the blue boxes. She opened it, there was no note inside. She slipped it into the player and listened as Randy Travis started singing I Told You So. As she listened to the song, she remembered it was a Wednesday evening. Lisa and Kathy stopped by the mailbox to bring in the mail. One of the items inside was a small package addressed to Kathy. From the handwriting, Kathy immediately knew what it was and who it was from, even though it had no return address. Kathy tore the brown wrapping paper off to reveal another blue box. Nothing was said as they walked to Lisa's apartment. Each woman was lost in her own thoughts, wondering what was inside the box. Inside the apartment, Lisa asked Kathy, Are you going to listen to the CD? Kathy shook her head yes. She could not speak without crying. Lisa took the CD and put it in her player. Randy Travis's voice filled the room. Suppose I called you up tonight and told you that I loved you. And suppose I said I want to come back home. And suppose I cried and said I think I finally learned my lesson. And I'm tired of spending all my time alone. If I told you that I realized you're all I ever wanted. And it's killing me to be so far away. Would you tell me that you loved me too? And would we cry together? Or would you simply laugh at me and say I told you so? Oh, I told you so. I told you someday you'd come crawling back and asking me to take you in. I told you so. But you had to go. Now I found somebody new and you will never break my heart in two again. Kathy's heart broke again, as it did that night in Lisa's apartment. Tom made it clear to her that he was done with her, he would never allow her back into his life again. For the first time in a long time, Kathy broke down into a full-blown crying fit. She let it all out, all her grief came flooding out. Oh, how she missed her former husband. She knew she had been a fool to give up what she had, just as Lisa told her when this first happened. She cursed her stupidity. Kathy quit her job at the insurance company soon after. She received the box in the mail from Tom. She took a position as a front desk receptionist at a local doctor's office. The pay was not as good, but she did not have to suffer through the disgusted looks and constant whispering of her co-workers. Kathy stayed with Lisa for three months. She rented a small condo from an elderly patient she met at the doctor's office. Her divorce from J.N. was moving through the court system. She started receiving support payments from John through the court. This money, combined with her new job, was enough to pay the rent on her new place. Kathy was not idle in her quest to regain her life with Tom. She called him many times. He never answered the phone, so she left messages for him to call her back. He never did. That only made Kathy more determined. Kathy began sending letters to the Kensington address where Tom still lived. Emails were sent every few days. These were never answered either. Kathy and Lisa had plans to go out Friday night. It was decided that Kathy would pick Lisa up, and they would get ready to go out at Kathy's new place. Kathy picked up Lisa at her home and drove to her new place. When they arrived at Kathy's apartment, they were surprised to see Tom's cousin Janice and Kathy's former co-worker Grace waiting in the parking lot. What are they doing here? Lisa wondered aloud. I have no idea, but I don't like seeing Janice again. And what is Grace doing here? Kathy was puzzled. Lisa had an inkling of why they would be here. She was hiding something from Kathy. 
the girls exited the car and wearily approached Janice and Grace. Janice waited for Kathy and Lisa to come near them before she spoke. Hi, Kathy, began Janice. Grace and I would like to talk to you about something that involves all of us. Would you mind if we came inside and spoke in private? Kathy was wary. She remembered the last time she spoke with Janice. She did not want a repeat of that confrontation. What is this about, Janice? I don't want any trouble, Kathy responded. Why don't you leave her alone? Why do you need to open old wounds, pleaded Lisa. Grace looked at Lisa and Kathy with sympathetic eyes before responding. I would, Lisa, however, I think Kathy needs to know about this. Please, Kathy, can we go inside and speak privately? Grace asked. Now thoroughly confused, Kathy looked at Lisa for some type of direction. Lisa nodded at Kathy, as if saying, let's go inside and talk with Janice and Grace. Kathy responded, let's go inside. Once inside Kathy's small condo, the girls made some small talk, complimenting Kathy on her decorating. Settling down around the kitchen table, Grace finally got around to why she and Janice were there. Grace began, Kathy, there is something I need to tell you, and it's not going to be something you want to hear. I know you have been sending letters and emails to Tom. I know about the telephone calls too. What business is it of yours if I try to communicate with him? This is still a free country. If I want to call him, I will. He has never told me not to. If he did, I would stop, Kathy retorted. He does want you to stop. He's too polite to tell you himself. He's afraid you won't take it well, Grace informed Kathy. Kathy, Janice interrupted, please just listen to us. We don't want to make this harder on you. We know you don't know this, Tom and Grace are getting married next Saturday. Kathy was shocked, Janice could see her eyes tear up. If you wanted to speak, it seems she was unable to, Kathy said. Please don't call, email, or send letters to Tom. I am a jealous woman, and I will not look kindly upon another woman trying to contact my new husband. It's too bad you never knew the real meaning of a gift. It's lucky for me, though. I realized what it was the first time I heard when I fall in love on your CD player that day in the office, added Grace. Janice reached into her bag and took out a thin red box and handed it to Kathy. There was no malice in Janice's voice as she told Kathy, listen to the CD inside the box. I am truly sorry it came to this. We want you to know we did not come here to hurt you, but you needed to know. Kathy turned to Lisa as Janice and Grace left the condo and asked, did you know about this? Yes, Lisa replied guiltily. I didn't know how to tell you. Grace told us a few weeks ago. I knew you were trying to get back with Tom. I knew it would hurt. I couldn't tell you. I knew it would hurt you too much. Kathy slid the CD into the slot on her player. She took another sip of wine and looked at the clock. It was 2.30 p.m. It had taken only an hour and a half for her to relive the journey with her former husband. She looked at the red box sitting at the end of the row of boxes. She picked up the box, took out the CD, and slipped it into the player, just like she did the week prior. The Chantels started singing their 1961 hit, Foolish Little Girl. Foolish little girl, you broke his heart and made him cry. And he's been blue since then. Now he's found somebody new. And you want him back again. Foolish little girl, fickle little girl. You didn't want him when he wanted you. He's found another love. It's her he's dreaming of. And there's not a single thing that you can do. Kathy realized that Janice was right. There was nothing she could do about the mess she had made of her life. She needed to stop trying to regain what she had lost. It was her fault, of course. She knew that Tom and Grace might be walking back from the altar now, a married couple, or maybe they were in the receiving line greeting guests. Whatever they were doing, she would not be thought of or missed. As she remembered, she finally realized what the gift truly was. It was something she had thrown away so casually, while Grace had understood it when she first heard when I fall in love that day in the office. She was sad it had taken her so long to understand. She finally understood it was the most special of gifts, something she longed for. Now, the gift was his love. 